Hey guys, welcome back to Magic TV. My name's Craig. It is 12 o'clock on a Sunday, which means it's time for a Q&A. Now, this is where I take all the questions that you've asked over the course of the week, and I try to answer them to the best of my ability. Now, I'm filming this Q&A quite early on this week because we've got a whole bunch of stuff going on, including filming with Murphy's later on in the week. So I'm currently filming this on Monday night. There's a whole bunch of questions here. However, if I've missed your question because you've answered it, asked it after Monday night, I apologise. Just drop it in the comments to this video and I promise I'll get to it next week. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's another Q&A. Thank you for all the kind words for everybody that's been saying really nice things about the channel. Really nice, th right, really nice things about the, uh, the Q&A. I really appreciate it. Before we start, don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already done so. But without that out of the way, let's get straight into this week's Q&A. Okay, so the first question is from Tyler S. And Tyler says, hi, Craig. Hi, Tyler. In response to some of the comments about freshening up Magic TV, I wouldn't reduce the amount of content you put out. I absolutely love the fact that your content is so diverse. Thank you. It opens up many doors for me to look into. However, like one of the other commentators said, an area of improvement could be searchability for all the great prop topics that you talk about. Um, yeah, I mean, that's something that we're looking into. I mean, the thing you've got to remember is on uh, the playlist, we have playlists for each individual topic on YouTube. So if you go onto YouTube and you click on playlists, you'll see all of the playlists for absolutely. Um, and so each individual video has a playlist. So the Q&As have a playlist. Um, the, um, uh, the review shows have a playlist. The um, five by fives, every single one of them has a playlist. And when you go in, you'll see that we break down each video by topic. So, for example, if you're going and looking at a QA, and a you can go into the playlist, pick a QA, and a and right at the very top, there'll be a list of everything that's talked about. And there'll be links through to that particular part of the video, like chapter uh, breakdowns. So you can literally click on the thing that you're interested in looking at and it'll take you to that part of the video. Um, so that's the first thing. You know, a lot of people don't realize that we have playlists broken down. But the other thing is, if you go to the website, so, you know, we've got magictv.org, and I'm going to go on there myself now, Magic TV, so www.magictv.org. A couple of things worth noting. First of all, uh, there's a schedule tab at the top, so if you click on schedule, uh, what that will do is that will show you all the different schedules uh, that we've got coming up, and it'll tell you when they come up. So you can see Magic Lives every single day at 6 o'clock, 5 by 5 so that's on Monday at 9 o'clock. So it's got all of the different things in there, Hidden Gems, Wednesday at 9 o'clock. And then there's a link in there to take you to that exact playlist. So if you think, well, you know what, I want to look at the latest Hidden Gems, you can click on there and it'll take you to that, play that playlist and you can see every single episode of Hidden Gems we've done. The other thing to, uh, to consider, and a lot of people don't realise this, is there's a blog section on Magic TV. So if you go into magictv.org and you click Blogs, we put a blog up every single day for each kind of meaty topic. So we don't put blogs up for the Magic Lives because obviously the Magic Lives go up every single day at six o'clock, but we do do blogs for the five by fives, the talk magics, the review shows, the the hidden gems, the magic stuffs, the rants, the um, um, everything, you know, the Q and A's, the review show specials, and the blog is searchable. So when you click on blog, if you click the little, um, magnifying glass for example and let's say I type in Paul Harris uh, this is all tagged so this should work let's find out if it does it's bringing up yes okay so it's it's brought up the three blogs that I did on Paul Harris I did three Paul Harris specials number one all on the five by five where I performed and talked about here my favorite tricks from Paul Harris and it's got all three of the specials there so you can click on any one of those blogs and it will tell you about what I actually did in the blog and then there's a link directly through to that video so, yeah, I mean, we have, it is searchable more than a lot of people realise. If you go onto magictv.org, click on the blog, click on anything that you want to, you want to, you know, you want to search about, absolutely anything at all, and there's a good chance it will come up. So if you, for example, want to talk about, somebody said they wanted videos on blank cards. If you type in just the word blank, I don't know, I'm trying this for the first time. Yeah, so we've got a whole bunch of stuff. We've got a 5x5 five five with blank card magic. Uh, we've got a Q&A with a uh, question about blank card magic. Um, we've got um, uh, a, review show, a review show here talking about blank card magic. So, there's, you know, there's a load of stuff on there. So it's worth checking on magictv.org. 
that's how it's searchable. You know, we, we've tried to make it as searchable as possible. You can look on the playlists as well. In terms of reducing the amount of content uh, and freshening up the channel, that is something that we're working on right now. And as and when we've got something in place, I'll let you know. Okay, so Magic Elliot uh, uh, asks two questions. Uh, and the first question is, crisps in or out of a sandwich? Absolutely out. Uh, Rylan would say in. He always puts his crisps in a sandwich, as does Sarah. But for me, it's on the side of the plate. That's how it's, it's staying. That's the first question. However, the most important question for a Magic Q&A is, what are your thoughts on the JW grip? Do you like it as a vanish? Or for, um, do you like it as a vanish for when people are with you? Or do you feel it's more of an Instagram move? Um, I think of the JW grip in the same way that I think of... Have I got coins? I think of the JW grip in the same way that I think of uh, edge grip or curl palm. In that um, it's a very useful move as long as you're aware of the angles. Now, a lot of people do think, like you, that it's too angly and it's really an Instagram move. But I disagree. I actually think it's a move that will work really well as long as you're aware of the angles. So, for example, with JW grip, if you don't know what JW grip is, by the way, uh, JW grip, also known as C palm, is holding the coin in that position. So basically, you're curling your forefinger around the coin like this. Um, so when your middle finger is in front of the coin, it makes it look like the hand is very empty, even though the coin's there, okay? Uh, and a lot of people use it to blow and make it disappear like that. A lot of people use it in the final coin of a three fly because your hand looks very empty before you throw the coin into the other hand. Um, I tend to think in all honesty, if you've got the coin in JW grip or C palm and you're in this position, as long as you're kind of angling it directly at eye level, you're absolutely fine. You, you The angles aren't good from behind. The angles aren't good from people looking up. or look, but, but generally, as a rule, the angles are absolutely fine. So that's something that's, um, that's, that's worth considering. And when you think about working with angles, uh, you just need to know the environment you're performing in. So this is a, a JW grip is a move that I'll use an awful lot uh, at a big table because it looks so fair. It really does. The problem is getting it into JW grip. A lot of people will do a retention pass and, and put it into there in that position. I like a way that um, uh, Ben Williams uh, published many, many years ago. He's got a great way of getting into JW grip. And the coin starts in like a French grip or a spellbound type position. And it looks like this. It looks like it just goes as you rub it. It looks really good. It goes straight to JW grip. And it's for me, it's the best way I've ever seen to get a coin into JW grip. And all that's happening is you're holding the coin there in that position. And... All that's going to happen is you're going to come in and you're going to take the coin directly into JW grip. And as you do, you just bring this hand and rotate this hand around like this. So it looks like you're literally just holding it here. There's no moves. There's no vanish. But then when you take that out of the way, it looks like it's, uh, it's, it's, it's gone. And then obviously you can produce it. Now, Russell Leeds, um, who was my ex-business partner, he published on a DVD called The Contractor a way of actually doing that as a change. Now, this is going to be the worst change in the world because I'm changing a, a half dollar into a half dollar, but you'll get the idea. Um, if, you're, if you have a coin in left-hand finger palm and you hold the coin that you're wanting to uh, change out in Ben's grip, in, in, and you're going to do, basically do Ben's move. So you're going to do Ben's move to get into JW grip, but because there's a coin already there, it looks like it changes when you rub the coin and it's a really nice change and then because this is in jw grip you can do a flash change back again so you can you can have this situation where you've got this coin you come up and you rub it and it changes and then you show it and you take it and it changes back again it's beautiful it really is and it's not even that angry at all in fact i use uh that in a karate coin routine so russell many many years ago published a karate coin routine and um, it was called the contractor. And it used a uh, half dollar and a karate coin. And what he did is he showed the coin and did the move. And it's a multi-phase routine, but he did the move like that. And it looked like his thumb was coming through. And then as he uh, pulled his thumb out, he switched back again. 
beautiful way of doing it. Really, really nice. And the thumb going through the um, uh, through the coin was really good. And that that move sets it up really nicely because you can have the coin examined. When you have the coin examined, you can come up like this and you can push the uh, the, th the thumb through the coin. And then as you take it out, you can you can switch it back again. And then you're in a position where you can switch again and you can switch back again. And you had a multi-phase routine. I combined that with a Joel given idea from the session. Uh, I just put a shell on top of the karate coin. So now you've got the karate coin, uh, but there's a shell on top of it. So your hands look very empty other than this coin. You can show the, uh, so you can show your hands really empty. You can put your thumb over the hole so you can show it from both sides. But now I can drop that coin and go with no moves. I can go straight into that display and have my thumb go through the coin and I can bring it back out again. And then I can put my finger through it again and bring it back out again. And then I'm in a situation where I can come over here like this. And, you know, and then I can do some Eric Jones type stuff and, you know, and so on and so forth. So on and so forth. Uh, but the point is, without laboring the points, the JW grip is not just an Instagram only uh, move. It can be done in a lot of different situations as long as you're aware of the environment in which you're performing in and you're aware of the angles that you've got around you in which you're sort of operating in. So hopefully that helps. Okay, so the next question is by Winston Panier. And Winston says, um, thanks for the uh, Q&A. You're more than welcome. Recently, after trying street performing, I've actually been doing really well. Congratulations. And I have a couple of questions. What are some good products for a close-up Rubik's Cube magic? Uh, I was looking into buying Rubik's Dream 360, but it's very pricey. Uh, do you have any other recommendations? Uh, okay, so that's the first question. Very good question. I wouldn't, do, Rubik's 360 is not really, if you're doing close-up, close-up magic, and you, you do say that you're looking for close-up, uh, up-close Rubik's Cube magic, I wouldn't do Rubik's 360. Um, it's really more of a stage piece. You need a bag, really, to get the most out of it, and um, there's other ways of achieving it unless you're on stage. So I wouldn't I wouldn't worry too much about um, about Rubik's 360. Realistically, the only gimmicked routines that you need if you're performing up close magic or close up magic with a Rubik's Cube is um, Rubik's Dream, not the 360 version, the original version, uh, specifically the mini shell. The mini shell is great uh, because you can just have it in your pocket. It takes up no pocket space. You can bring out the regular cube. You can bring out the mini cube, you can have it mixed and, and take it back, put it over there, take the cube back and you can do a, a matching routine. And it's a really nice way of doing that. Uh, the other uh, gimmick set that works really well for close-up magic and mix and mingle and walk around is uh, the Insta, Insta Solve, the Insta Cube. Uh, both Henry's products, Henry Harrius, and both absolutely fantastic. And they both work really well together. Some of the other stuff like Venom Cube and Rubik's 360 and things like that, it's really designed more for a platform or a stage performer, in my opinion. Um, however, when I'm doing walk around magic, I just carry a cube with me and I do a whole bunch of ungimmicked cube magic. So I don't actually use gimmicks at all. I use ungimmicked cube magic and I do a lot of my own routines. Some of the stuff you'll see in Cube 3 is fantastic by Stephen Brundridge. Some of the original stuff from Takamiza Sui is also really, really good. I've got some stuff going up on the Netrix, my... Uh, my um, um, solve my uh, shake solve and my timing force that's going up on the metric soon however another resource that you might want to look into and I did a review show special on this a little while ago is the refractor project uh, by Colin Klaus and Kev Gregson Kev G uh, the refractor and I've got it here in front of me I, I put it up because uh, I wanted to tell you about it it's rubikscubemagician.co.uk Refractor by Kev Chi and Colin Klaus is an essential toolbox for any magician that performs with Rubik's Cubes. The project includes moves, souls, forces, routines, and the best part is it only uses just a cube, no gimmicks in sight. So it's all gimmickless cube magic, and it's an entire project that's online, and um, it's it's incredible. There's some really good stuff in there. You got the... Uh, so there's three volumes altogether plus all spark which is kind of like a fourth volume you can get all of them at a really cheap price and then you've got access to them forever um and you can get for free access to their level up program which teaches you a few simple things and teaches you how to solve a cube so if you're looking to do something close up 
and uh, you want a really good resource that you can keep going back into time and time again, I'd recommend the Refractor Project. I think it's really good. And I think you'd probably get more out of that than you would do buying a gimmick. So there you go. Uh, I would recommend the Refractor Project by Kev and Colin. Okay, so the next question is again by Winston Paneer, and Winston says, uh, do you know any good coin magic routines where the coins don't teleport or switch places? Uh, in my set, I already have lots of tricks that do that. So they don't teleport, they don't switch places. So basically, you're removing transpositions and you're removing coins across style routines. Okay, and three fly and all variations thereof. So the first thing that I would say is you can do the same thing as a coins across, but make it feel very different. So for example, if you do a coins across to somebody and then you do a matrix, they'll think of that as two completely separate routines. In reality, the coins are teleporting, but they'll think of it as something very, very different. Likewise, a coin through table, when you think about it, is just a teleportation. The coins are teleporting from one hand to the other. But if you do, um, if you do it in the context of pushing coins through a table, it, it, feels like a different style of routine it doesn't feel like the same thing it feels like it's a penetration and with that in mind you saw me messing around with my karate coin earlier on karate coin is a perfect example of a routine um that's not a teleportation and not a transposition you know taking a coin putting it uh, putting your finger in pulling it out that sort of thing works really well um also look into david roth because david had some amazing ways of dressing up routines so they are more than just the sum of their parts so for example a routine that you might want to look into is wild coin and the whole idea of wild coin is that you you take a um uh, say four half dollars for example and you turn them into copper coins one at a time until in the end all four coins have turned copper and then they turn back into silver now one of my favorite ways of doing that is the twilight coin uh, the twilight twilight coin routine i think it's good is it twilight it's not twilight twilight zone twilight zone coin routine or something. It's by uh, um, uh, Michael Rubenstein, and he performed it on Pen and Teller Foolish. It's a great routine, well worth looking into. Uh, however, David Roth has got a version of that called the Rainbow, where he's got a plastic rainbow and you've got uh, uh, four coins. And the whole idea is that you take the coins and you touch the rainbow. As you touch the rainbow, you touch the coins and the coins change into the color of the rainbow. And at the end, you have a pot of gold that's produced really beautiful routine and that's something that David was really good at he was really good at taking coin plots and just really turning them on their head so another example of that is the portable hole routine uh, which is just crazy if you've never seen it before go on YouTube and check out the portable hole routine by David Roth um, the idea is that the coins are produced out of a out of an invisible purse they're dropped into a hole uh, an, uh, a portable hole on the table where they disappear they come back they disappear again they come back there's so many wonderful moments of magic with that routine there really is um and uh it's 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 highly recommended to learn uh other other things where they don't teleport or switch would be um let me just think of a few different ideas here so again using david roth as a source of inspiration look into uh tuning fork uh, which is all based on it's it's a beautiful coin routine all based on sound it's the illusion of sound and uses a tuning fork and the coins appear and vanish but the, uh, you hear them appear and vanish it's a beautiful routine it really is um uh you've got uh that coin routine by uh, paul harris is it twilight it's a twilight or eclipse um where coins are appearing in a mirror so you show a mirror and you show a coin and you pull the mirror away and a coin's just appeared. I've got a few different versions of that, but that's a really nice routine. And again, it's another example of taking a good common plot in coin magic, which in this case, we're looking at a, um, uh, a production. And rather than doing it as just a normal production, what you're doing is you're adding a mirror and you're talking about reflection and it becomes a completely different thing. Uh, and on that subject, look into magic with uh, uh, handkerchiefs. Uh, something like expansion of texture, um, even though it's kind of like a transposition, it's made very, very different because you've got the handkerchief in play, right? Uh, which is well, well worth looking into as well. And uh, one thing that I spend a lot of time thinking about, one of my favorite plots in coin magic is when you combine coins with a deck of cards. 
So for example, the coin will vanish and it'll appear inside the deck next to a selected playing card. Um, and there's lots of different versions of this. I have about three different versions on the Netrix, um, but it's the idea of a coin vanishing and appearing in the deck right next to a selected card. Now I've got various different versions where it happens again and again and again, and then you produce four aces and then the, the four coins appear and they appear underneath each ace. But you know, just that very simple plot of a coin vanishes and appears in a, in, in a deck next to a freely selected card, that's a really fun kind. And if you want a self-working version of that, Alakazam sell a Rob Bromley uh, item called RB Coin Deck which is an almost self-working version of that plot where you get a gimmick deck that does all the work for you. So yeah, I mean, I, I've gone through a few there. There's a lot more. Look at the sleeve by David Roth. Hanging coins again by David Roth. Um, the list goes on and on and on. There's lots of different ways of doing coin magic where you're not actually teleporting or transposing coins. It's just kind of thinking out the box a lot of the time. Okay, so the next question is Doro66, and he says, Hi Craig, great video as always, thank you. Can you give me tips and advice on how to tackle a magic book if I haven't read one ever? Thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, um, I, 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 magic books, depending on the book that you're getting and the size of the book that you're getting, can be very overwhelming. Like, you can have so much material that uh, it sometimes gets to a point where you just don't learn anything because there's just too much and you don't know where to start. Uh, I always and there's no right or wrong way of tackling a magic book. I don't read it like a normal book, so I don't read it page on page on page on page on page. Um, I always read the introduction and the forward and that sort of thing, and uh, I earmark any essays because I like reading essays. But outside of that, what I'll do is I will go through, and I think I've talked about this briefly once before, but I'll go through the book. And I'll read the effect for each individual trick. Most magic books have an effect. It's kind of like the ad copy for the for the book, uh, for the trick. It's like, okay, this is what happens in this trick. And if there's one that immediately grabs my attention based on how the effect's written up, I'll make a note of that. So I'll have myself a piece of paper, like an A4 piece of paper, which I will put into the book. And sometimes I'll even use it as a bookmark. And I'll write down on that A4 piece of paper the um, the the tricks that sound interesting based on the effects. And then once I've done that, let's say there's 40 tricks in the book and I've whittled it down to 20 because 20 of them sound really interesting. What I'll then do is I'll briefly read over what it is that's entailed in order to do that effect. Like I'll have a very quick skim. A lot of the time in books, there's a requirement section or a setup section and different bits and bobs that you need. If there's something where it's like, oh my gosh, you're going to need this, 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 and I'm going to be running around getting tons of equipment, I'll asterisk it. Because a lot of the time, especially when I get a new book, I want some instant gratification. I want to, I want to learn a trick that I can practice immediately. Um, and if it's something that's going to require me to do a scavenger hunt for all the bits and pieces that I need, I'll probably miss it. It doesn't mean that I'm not going to learn it immediately. It's why I'm asterisking that one. It's, it's one that I'm probably going to go back to, but not initially. Also, if I'm going through routine, if I'm going through and something looks incredibly difficult um, or there's techniques that I haven't actually learned before, like if I'm looking at something and it's like, right, you're going to need to classic palm 16 coins in each hand and, uh, and do your best impression of Reed McClintock, uh, and, you know, imagine if Reed McClintock and Danny Goldsmith had a, uh, you know, had a love child. That's who you need to be in order to do this routine. I'm probably going to think, right, OK, asterisk that one as well. So that's one that I will want to learn. But initially, I want some instant gratification. I want to know that I've learned a couple of routines in this book um, so I can get a flavour of who the person is that's wrote the book. Right. So I'll whittle it down to routines that I think I can have fun practising because that's part. That's the most important thing with magic. You have to have fun with it. It's a hobby at the end of the day. Yes, you might make money from it. You might be a professional magician or whatever the case may be. But you want it to you want it to be fun. And if you're uh, if you're looking at a book like wading through treacle and it's like right, I have to learn every single thing out of this book. And I met somebody who did that once. He learned every single trick from every single book, and he hated it because he was learning tricks he, he just wasn't interested in. And, and you can't get you can't get 
a book where you're going to learn every single trick out of that book, right? You want to make it fun for yourself. And how do you make it fun? By learning the sort of magic that you like performing. And only you know that. There might be a type of magic or a style of magic that you love performing that I don't. Or it, it's also down to the individual. Like some people I know, they read a book and what they want is they want new moves. They like learning moves. That's great. Other people buy a book and they don't care about moves. They're only looking for things that they can immediately learn and put into the repertoire. That's absolutely fine. There's no right or wrong. But figure out what you enjoy about learning magic and make sure that you're getting that out of the book first. Um, and then when you've done that, you can go back and look at all the other stuff. Because just, just because it... It might make you know, just because, for example, you need to do a scavenger hunt to get stuff doesn't mean it's not going to be an awesome trick. It just means that you're going to have to put a bit of work in. Right. So you can always go back to those routines and, and figure out what it is that you need to be able to learn them. But I, I always start off. And as I say, this is only my opinion. I always start off by whittling down the tricks to the ones that I want to learn, first of all, that speak to me, that look like the sort of routine that I would perform, that looks like there's, a, a, you know, not a difficult um, set up or anything like that or not something that's going to take me forever to uh, get into a position where I'm ready to start learning it and I'll go for those first and then I'll expand after that into other areas of the book so hopefully that answers your question but if it doesn't let me know and I'll clarify it again Okay, so the next question is Adrian Suter, and Adrian says, Hi, Craig. Absolutely love the recent video on tricks that make the spectator the star of the show. Thank you. Which spectator do you normally choose for this kind of trick, an introvert or an extrovert? One who's already very interested or one who seems rather distanced? Very much depends, and this comes down to experience. It depends on, the main factor it depends on is if I'm doing close-up or I'm doing stage. Um, and very quickly, we'll talk about each one. First of all, I was doing a gig with Ryland, a couple of gigs actually on Saturday uh, with Ryland, Saturday just gone. And uh, we did two illusion shows. Now, one of the illusion shows was a 50th birthday party. And whenever I'm doing an illusion show or a stage show and there's a important person there, whether it be a bride or a groom, or in this case, a 50th birthday, I'll go up to them and I'll say, look, would you like me to bring you up during the show? Or would you like me to leave it? It's totally up to you. I'm fine if you don't want me to bring you up, but I'd like to know now and not put you on the spot uh, during the actual show. And people appreciate that. Uh, and that was learned through experience because I remember uh, performing once and uh, many, uh, very early on in my career as a stage performer and I got booked for a wedding and I tried to bring the groom up on stage. He just didn't want to come. And it was a very awkward situation because he came up on stage and he was like whispering into my ear, I don't want to be up here, please send me back down. And this was happening in front of everybody. And I realised at that point, in order to pull this off, in order to make this work, um, I'm going to have to make sure that I don't want to bring somebody up that doesn't want to be up on stage, especially if it's the client. So with stage magic, I'll always check with the client first of all. Uh, a lot of the time when you're doing corporates or even a wedding, They'll have somebody that you want. they want you to bring up on stage, the best man at a wedding or the, the, the joker of the office in the, uh, in the corporate gig that you're doing. And a lot of the time you can take that into consideration. But what I'll do, and again, it comes down from experience, when I'm performing on stage, within the first few minutes, I'm, I'm warming the audience up. So I have a warm up that I do at the beginning of a show that gets the audience on side, gets them into what I'm doing, makes them realize that this is going to be a fun show that they're going to enjoy. And during the course of that warm up, I'm clocking people and I'm keeping track of who I think will be a good spectator, who I think won't be a good spectator. And, uh, and I, I, that's just a mental check because a lot of the routines that I do on stage, I am going to be bringing people up on uh, in on stage in front of everybody. So I need to kind of have a rough idea of who's going to be good and who's not. When I come out on stage, you can always tell the people. You can't really tell if someone's an introvert or an extrovert based on just how they're sitting down in an audience. It's difficult to tell when you're performing on stage. But you can tell if somebody's giving you no eye contact at all and trying to look in the other direction, they might not be the best person to pick. You don't want to bring somebody up who doesn't want to be there because then they're not going to riff off you very well, right? Now, in terms of close-up, again, it depends on the situation. Is this a walk-around gig? Uh, is it performing to groups of three or four people? Is it big tables of 10 people? Uh, because that very much depends. Uh, you are more likely to be able to tell if somebody's introverted or extroverted 
um, in a close-up situation. I try to get everybody involved in close-up, especially if I'm doing a big table. I'll just look at every single person, every single individual. And if I say to somebody, hey, can you help me with this? And if they go, no, I go, okay, not a problem. You can be the spectator. You can just watch. Uh, you, sir, you look very excited to help with this. And I'll immediately just deflect onto somebody else. Um, so again, who do I choose? I, it very much depends um, on, on, on each individual situation. You know, a, a lot of the time, if somebody's super excited, they might not be the best person to pick. If they're just over the top, you know, I, I've done gigs in the past where you go, right, I need somebody to come up and help me. And there's somebody going, oh, pick me, pick me. And, and everyone's like, yeah, get Barry. He's the one that's going to be an asshole if you're not careful. He's the one that's going to be trying to take over the show. So unless you're a strong performer and you've got experience dealing with that sort of situation, it's not always the best person that you want to bring up. So again, it comes down to experience and it changes on literally a gig by gig basis. Okay, so the next person is Gert Sankrian, and Gert says, thanks for the time to answer the questions. You're more than welcome. I met Peter Nardi yesterday at Leo's Crazy Carousel. He's such a kind man. Yes, he is. Love to see him perform at his Alakazam table, and he brought something along, uh, some interesting stuff. I now have an apparition at my house, and it's amazing, Craig. Oh, I think I know what you're talking about, and I'm so glad you like it, and I can't wait for Alakazam to launch it. Here's a sneak peek. I think it's going to be the 30th of June. And when I say I think it's going to be the 30th of June, I know it's going to be the 30th of June. I know because I've got my hotel booked to Ashford. So I'm going to be going down there on the 30th of June. Look out for it. I think this is going to be one of the biggest things that I've ever done. Okay, so the next question is from King OK. Hey, King. Um, awesome Q&A as always. Thank you. I think you might have missed my question, so I'll ask it again. Do you know any tricks that use blank-backed playing cards? Maybe you could do a video about three tricks using blank-backed cards that you've never seen before. Absolutely. I know a ton of them, and I'd be more than happy to do a video of three tricks using blank-backed cards that you've never seen before. There's a ton of stuff that you can do with blank back cards. Um, a lot of the routines that you do with blank back cards, they will involve blank faced cards or double blank cards as well. Like I bought out a DVD many, many years ago called Blank, which was a collection of routine with blank cards. And um, um, there, were, there were some routines on there that used blank backed cards. But yes, I will put that to the top of my list and I will put a video together for you of three blank, three routines with blank cards, blank backed cards, that you've never seen before. But my advice to you is if you haven't already done so, go and subscribe to the RSVP Magic mailing list. Okay, that's Russ Stevens Video Production, RSVP Magic. They've not released anything for the last few years uh, because Russ has been busy with the Blackpool Magic Convention and BGT, uh, but they're making a comeback. And I think you'll be very interested in what their first project is that's uh, released on their comeback. That's all I'm saying. Go sign up to their mailing list. I think it's going to be something you're going to find very interesting. Okay, so the next question is Rob Magic 101. And Rob Magic says, hey, Craig, I have a question. I am married to a Turkish Cypriot and I have performed to my wife's family. However, I have performed magic to them um, and they all seem to enjoy it, but feel because they don't speak English, the effects lose their impact. It could be my fault as the performer, though, but just wondering if you have any experience um, with this language barrier and how you got around it or what effects you would recommend to do if there is a language barrier. I want to entertain my wife's family and show them good entertaining magic. That's a great question, Rob. Um, I uh, live in Staffordshire and very near me, about 20 minutes away, half an hour away, there's the JCB, uh, big JCB factory and they do a lot of corporate entertaining and they've had me come in and perform many, many times many times and like more than I can remember and a lot of the time it's to do mix and mingle magic they've got this uh, sort of uh, place where everyone sits down to eat dinner and uh, they, they kind of have a factory tour after that and um, yeah uh, I, a lot of the time when I'm doing mix and mingle magic uh, and I'm doing table magic there uh, nobody speaks English they're bringing people in from all over the world and, and nobody speaks English the last time I was there a few weeks ago it was all French speaking people um, and I, I've adapted my performances to work in that sort of environment and the way I've done it is just by making everything super visual and rather than speaking too much um, kind of gesturing for what I want them to do so let's say I'm doing a coins across 
um, I will, and, and, and this is the lazy way of doing it, in all honesty. I mean, if you want a, the, the hardworking, uh, professional way of doing it, then go check out Lee Thompson, uh, who's one of the best pickpockets in the world, if not the best pickpocket in the world. I think he speaks about 27 languages or something like that. So, you know, when he gets a gig and there's, an, there's a group of people and he has to perform for them, he'll just learn their language. I don't have time for that, to be perfectly honest. So I've adapted what I do. Um, so, for example, um, when I go up to a group of people, I'll always do something really visual to get their attention. So I'll walk over and I'll go, hi, my name's Craig, I'm a magician. And as I say that, I'll produce a jumbo coin. And I'll do kind of like a very quick version of Flurius where the coin vanishes and appears down there, vanishes and appears down there, throw it up in the air, it disappears, pull it out, back out of the air and turn it into a five inch coin. That will immediately say to them, okay, this guy's a magician. And I'll, I, at the end, I'll be like, okay, thank you very much. Um, and then a lot of the stuff that I do is super visual, but it'll, I can explain it very, very easily without speaking. And I will speak, but, but, but there's not lines or jokes or gags, and I'm speaking very, very slowly and very, very clearly. So if I was doing a coins across, for example, I'd say, can you hold your hands out for me, please? And, and I'll grab their wrists and turn their hands over. I'll then put some coins into their hands and I'll say four coins and I'll do the coins across, boom, like that. And, that they totally understand exactly what's going on. Another one that I found that's really good in this scenario is Rubik's Cubes, because it's universal. Everybody knows what a Rubik's Cube is. Everybody knows that when you mix it, it's very difficult to solve. So when I bring out a mixed up Rubik's Cube and I carry on mixing it, and then I just take it and throw it up in the air and it solves, they totally get that. So the long convoluted routines, they don't really work as well. The stuff that's super visual, and, and very, very clear to follow and can be explained very, very easily. That's the sort of stuff you want to do, at least in my opinion. Okay, so he's back again. It's the Drunk Magic Ukulele Player. And let's get the craziness out of the way because he's got actually a really interesting question here. Um, so first of all, uh, the craziness. Do you think it would be appropriate for David Penn to be called David Sharpie? I'm going to find out. Next time I see him, I'll call him David Sharpie and see what happens. Um, close up is more intimate. I'm constantly worried about flashing. Do you think I shouldn't worry about it? It's worth the risk of being charged with indecent exposure. Um, yeah, you want to make sure that you you're definitely wearing pants and trousers when you're when you're doing magic. You don't want to really expose yourself. That's really not a good thing to do. Um, and the 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 question that actually makes sense is in this modern age with clever gimmicks and digital tricks, do you think the art of magic will die and magicians will have no skill? I'm not a very good magician, but I'm very proud when I learn a traditional move, a traditional move. You know, I've had that. I've had people say that before. Oh, is magic going to die because of the digital age? Uh, no, I don't. I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's always mystifying. I think magic just evolves as we go on and sleight of hand uh, will still work now as it will in 50 years time, just as it did 50 years before. On that subject, I, I, I hear a lot of people going, oh, I don't use magic with mobile phones. I don't use app-based magic um, because um, it's, it's obvious that you're using an app. My attitude is, to that is, I think that's ridiculous. My attitude is very simple. Um, the reason why ha magic with handkerchiefs was so popular 100 years ago was because every gentleman carried a handkerchief around with them. So because you, you read the old magic books and it's like, hey, take a handkerchief, burn the end of it, restore it and give it back to them. You could borrow a handkerchief 100 years ago, a linen handkerchief, in order to do something like that. These days, that doesn't happen. The most organic types of magic is when you can borrow something off the spectator and do magic with their borrowed object. So I love it when I can borrow a phone and I can do some magic using their phone and my phone or maybe just their phone, depending on the routine that I'm performing. I don't think people are thinking, oh, you know, Craig's cheating because he's using my phone. I'm just using an object that they're used to. They carry around this with them every single day. It's got everything. It's got their life on it. They're very intimate with their mobile phone. If I take it and I do something crazy with it and then give it back to them, that gets insane reactions. Some of the strongest stuff I do uses app-based magic. So I really don't think that's an issue at all. And anybody who thinks it is an issue isn't performing to real people because, you know, if they are getting the reactions that I'm getting, 
by doing magic with apps, then they wouldn't be saying that. It's like, ask David Penn, his brand, you know, you mentioned David Penn earlier, or David Sharpie, he's branded himself as the tech magician, and he totally, 100%, just owns tech-based magic. Uh, you don't see him getting terrible reactions. So I don't think it's an issue at all. Okay, so the next question is Michael Warsham, and Michael says, what does NLP mean? Uh, NLP stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming, and it's basically uh, the concept of uh, programming people to... I, I don't really know much about NLP, to be perfectly honest, even though I've got friends that do it. Uh, but it's, it's basically the concept of programming people um, to take on certain behaviours um, over a period of time or something like that. Like, uh, I know there's a lot of NLP practitioners that will... Um, you know, help people stop smoking and, and, and things like that. Uh, I, I have a friend who's a certified NLP practitioner and he's also a magician. A lot of magicians use NLP as, especially mentalists, they use NLP as a way of kind of um, saying that the trick is done. Ah, oh, okay, yeah, so yeah, Darren Brown did it or does it. Uh, hey, this, this, this uses neuro-linguistic programming and NLP, um, which it doesn't 99% of the time, 99.999% uh, of the time. It's a peak device or something like that. But uh, yeah, that's what it is. NLP, neuro-linguistic programming. Okay, so I've got uh, several people uh, asking me to enlighten them with more horror stories. I've got millions of horror stories from my career. Uh, millions and millions and millions of them. Uh, Erdnace23 says, fantastic horror story. Any more of them, please share. Last week I talked about the... Um, what did I talk about last week? Uh, it was the ring, wasn't it? It was the ring um, for Rolls-Royce. Uh, the borrowed ring uh, flying into the kitchen. And the week before, it was going to the kids' show. And it was... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, having every single kid in that room crying at the same time. Uh, I've got thousands of horror stories, I really have. Let me let me tell you one more. I don't think I've told this on the channel before. And it's the first time I ever properly performed on stage. Now, um, I used to have a business partner, a guy called Russell Leeds. I've mentioned him before in this Q&A. And um, him and I wanted to be on stage, but didn't really know what we needed to do in order to be on stage. We were competent close-up magicians and kids entertainers, but they had no idea. This is before Slightly Unusual. This is before Illusions. This is before I'd ever performed on stage at all. And um, we had an opportunity uh, to perform at a comedy club. We actually had a phone call. I'm pretty sure it's in Warrington. Uh, we had a phone call, uh, or I had a phone call. And it was like, hi, I'm XYZ. I'm this person from this comedy club. Uh, would you be interested in, in headlining our comedy club? Um, there's going to be about 80 people in the room, 80 to 100 people. We're having a variety night. We'd love you to come along and headline. Uh, we've heard good things. How they had heard good things about us, I don't know. We were jobbing close-up magicians and kids entertainers. And um, I went down the process of saying uh, yes. You know, always, always say yes and then work it out later. And it was, it was coming up fairly soon. It was coming up in about six weeks' time. And uh, they were like, brilliant, okay, so we're going to have two halves. We'd like you to close the first half, and then we'd like you to close the second half. It was like, yeah, okay, brilliant, sounds awesome. Now, bearing in mind that we had six weeks to get our act together, um, we did absolutely zero preparation at all. Absolutely zero preparation at all. Uh, and the problem with this, it was a comedy club, and it was... a performing on stage at a comedy club. Now, that would have been fine, other than the fact that we weren't funny and we'd never performed on stage before. Now, that could have been rectified by uh, spending a lot of time and effort practicing and rehearsing and coming up with ideas, because we wanted to do it together as like a two-person show, and we thought that'd be really good. Uh, however, we didn't do any of that. In fact, we started thinking about it about two days before the event actually took place. Um, and uh, we wrote the worst possible act you could imagine. We planned 20 minutes for the end of the first half, 25 minutes at the end of the first half, 25 minutes at the end of the second half. And I remember getting to this comedy club and as, we were, and, and, and as I walked into the venue and I saw the room, I'd realised that we'd made a big mistake even saying yes. 
We'd never been in that environment before, let alone being headlining acts. Uh, we'd made a huge mistake. And the first half, we were sitting in the wings watching the other acts go on and they were hilarious. And we were crapping ourselves. We were like, oh my God, these guys are genuinely funny. Like, we're not funny. We're not funny. We, we've got mildly amusing situational humour at best. This is gonna, we're going to die in our arse. We convinced ourselves we were going to die in our arse, which is good because we were going to die in our arse. Um, and they were filming this whole thing. They, had, they were planning on doing more of these, so they were filming everything. And then they made a big deal of us going up on stage, closing the first half. Please welcome um, Craig Petty and R Russell Leeds. So we walked out, and um, 10 minutes into the act, the entire audience hated us with a passion. It wasn't funny, it wasn't entertaining, it was very kiddified because all we'd done in the past was like kid shows. Uh, we didn't know any routines that would play, but it was just dread. Everything was dreadful about it. And the big routine that we thought of for the end of the first half was this lottery prediction. You see, I had, you, now this is gonna tell you how long ago it was. I had a Fabrice uh, pad. Um, which, if you don't know what it is, it's kind of like the precursor to the Labco Mindbuster pad. So it was like a, a clipboard, and they wrote something down on the clipboard on a piece of paper, and it would send that information uh, to a monitor, which was um, you know, backstage. And the whole idea that I had, and I thought this was a really good idea, me and Russell came up with this together, uh, it was going to be a lottery prediction where we had somebody on stage write down six numbers randomly, I would get them to write them down on stage. Russell would be backstage with a change bag, a flat change bag and lottery balls from one to 49. Because back then the lottery was 49, not 59. And as they wrote the numbers down, he would take the balls and put them in the bag in one side of the bag. So, and then he'd take the other balls and put it in the other side of the bag. And basically he'd have the six balls ready to be forced and it would appear very fair because they wrote the numbers down, right? And then, and the whole idea is I would get him to write the numbers down and I'd have Russell come out with the bag and I'd have somebody else draw the balls out and it'd be this incredible coincidence. That was the idea. Uh, it was very procedural. It wouldn't work in a comedy club. Just getting them to write six numbers down was boring, but I did it. The entire audience hated this at this point anyway. And I remember turning around, I remember I'm on stage, remember, and he's in the, uh, the wings and uh, he's just backstage and, um, you know, the whole plan is by the time he's wrote the sixth number down, he should be in position so I can bring him out on stage. So I said, Russell, can you bring out the balls, please? Ready for the uh, ready for the draw of the lottery. And I just heard him say, oh, well, he was on his he was on his uh, mic and uh, he said no. And I'm like, what, what do you mean? No. Uh, and he's like, I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm not bringing the balls out. And I said, why not? And he said, uh, I can't find them. Now, there's two issues here. The first issue is, how can he not find them? They're right there in front of him on the table, laid out. And second of all, how unprofessional is this? I'm just having a chat with my mate backstage about the fact that he can't find his balls. Like, and there's this guy on stage that's now got this piece of paper folded up in his hand with the numbers on. Everybody just hates us. It was dreadful. And I look into the wings and I look over into the wings and there's Russell going, which I interpreted as the, the clipboard hasn't worked. So in other words, he didn't know the numbers, so he couldn't put the numbers into the flat change bag. And uh, so no experience on stage. My mind is racing. Oh my God, what am I going to do? So I remember saying to him, um, do you think you can find them? And he's like, I doubt it. I'm like, have you, go ch have you gone checked in the car? And he's like, I don't think that's going to help. Now, bearing in mind, we're having this conversation on stage. I looked over. You could see that the guy that booked us is horrified at this point. Absolutely, completely and totally horrified. Um, so I'm thinking, how am I going to get out of this? The only way I can get out of this is by getting to write the, write the numbers down on a piece of paper again and hope it works. How am I going to do that? Okay, so I said to him, I went back to the guy on stage, while we're waiting for the balls, you wrote these numbers down and there's no way I could know what these numbers are. You can't see through the paper, can you? And I took the paper off him, he folded it up into sixths. I said, you can't see through the paper, can you? No, he can't see through the paper. And as I gestured forward, I flicked this piece of paper open 
And I, I, I looked back and I was like, oh, I've seen the numbers now. Oh, we're going to have to write them out again, which was just the cringiest thing. But I couldn't see another option. So I was like, hey, I'll take the pad and write them down again. I knew it would work the second time because as he was writing the numbers down on mic, Russell went, yes. Um, I mean, just the height of professionalism at this point, right? Um, so he wrote the numbers down. I was like, uh, have you got the balls? Yes, I have. Bring them out. Okay. So he brings the balls out and I get somebody else to draw the numbers out and, and he confirms that they're there. And he got bored at this point and he'd wrote one, two, three, four, five, six. The whole thing was terrible. It was dreadful. We walked out on off stage and we re we 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 knew we were shit. Everybody, the other acts knew we were shit. Everybody knew we were shit. And bearing in mind that he wanted us to close both halves, he came up to us in the break and he's like, um, yeah, I've been thinking, rather than closing the second half, we'd like you to open the second half. And rather than doing 20 minutes, we'd like you to do five minutes. And we were like, yeah, okay, we know what this means. Uh, we know what this means. And... Um, Okay, right, okay, no problem. Uh, and uh, we went out and did our five minutes and it was just dreadful. It was awful. It was terrible. What was hilarious is he was filming everything. And uh, and, and I remember saying to him, are oh, you going to be filming the second half? He's like, no, we've run out of tape. And I'm thinking they're digital cameras. Uh, and then he did, He wasn't filming us, but he was filming everyone else. He, he, he just wanted us to go. I'm pretty sure of it. So we did our five minutes. We sucked. They didn't want us there. We didn't want to be there. But, you know, we were too dumb to quit. And then we uh, we sat down. And um, uh, there was like a little area off to the side where the audience could see us. And because uh, we couldn't leave. So we had to sit there while the other acts performed. And the the new guy that was closing the whole show, I'll never forget his name. His name was DJ K Weezy. DJ K Weezy. And his gimmick was he would rap about stuff that the audience would give him. They'd give him a subject and he'd create a bespoke rap about that particular subject. I had to sit there with Russell while he spent probably the best part of 20 minutes rapping about how shit we were. Um, and it was it was just dreadful. We were it was so embarrassing that you know, like sometimes you do a gig and it's not gone great, and you can laugh about it afterwards. There was no laughing about this gig. We got in the uh, we got in the car, and the drive back from Warrington, we didn't say a word to each other. He dropped me off at my house. I got out without saying a word to him. It was like two days before we spoke again and talked about how horrific it was. It was a horrific experience. And one that put me off performing on stage for a very, very, very long time. Luckily, I bounced back a few years later, but it was a massive setback. And I suppose the um, the moral of this story, if there is a moral, is to be prepared. Be prepared. Uh, it's fine taking on uh, uh, something that you aren't ready to do as long as you make sure you're ready before you go to the gig. Um, you know, you've only got one chance to make a first impression and you don't want to wreck it. And that's what I did. And it took me a long time. It was a setback in my career, for sure. I think I would have been further along a lot quicker if that hadn't have happened. But, you know, uh, it was a horrible experience. OK, so the next question is from Trixty Tom. And Trixty Tom says, hi, Craig. In a video of yours I watched recently, you mentioned how you sometimes do a Rubik's Cube routine in your close up sets all the time, actually. How do you typically carry a cube round on your person in a close-up scenario from table to table? I imagine they're hard to fit in your pocket if you're wanting to perform one trick after the other. I'm just wondering how I could carry two Venom cubes around, for example, as well as other tricks in my pocket. I don't want the cubes to look bulky in my pockets and untidy. Would you suggest wearing a bum bag, for example, just to carry the cubes as you hop from table to table? Would this distract from the smart attire you might be wearing like a suit? Sorry for the long question. Okay, so very good question. Uh, first of all, you can get a cube holder from Prop Dog, which is really good. Um, so if I go into Prop Dog, they have a cube holder. Uh, let's have a look here. If I type it, I'm on Prop Dog right now. Let's have a look here. And it's like a little thing that you clip onto your belt. And uh, what it does is you just put a cube in there and it just stays in there uh, until you need it. It's really good. There you go. A uh, cube holder by Jerry O'Connell and Prop Dog. Rubik's Cube Shell Holder. There you go. Um, uh, the Jerry O'Connell Rubik's Cube Shell Holder is the perfect solution for carrying around your Rubik's Cube shell. 
handmade in the quality leather, blah, 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 blah. Carry both a regular size Rubik's Cube shell, such as Rubicon, Venom Cube, etc. Uh, it can be, a, it, it, the holder has a belt loop, so it can only be used if you're wearing a belt. And it's a little square thing and the, the cube sticks out of it. You can use it for a normal cube. You can use it for a cube with a cube shell on. So if you have two of them, one there, one there, you could carry around Venom Cube and do Venom Cube. Now, in all honesty, I don't do Venom Cube walking around. I just, if I'm doing walk around magic or mix and mingle magic, I just have one cube which will go into my pocket and uh, it doesn't bulk out the pocket too much at all. So I just have one cube in my pocket and I'm ready to go. And I just do magic with one cube. If, however, I'm doing table magic, uh, I'll have one of those bags that Stephen Brumwich popularized, uh, like a, a paper bag. And I'll have two cubes in there. I'll have a clear cube, which is again by Prop Dog. And I'll also have a regular cube. And I'll have a full routine that I do that runs about seven or eight minutes that uses the clear cube as a finale. And it uses the regular cube. And it uses the bag. And uh, it's on Magic Lives and 5 by 5 so I'm sure you've seen it. Um, and what I like about that is when I walk over to the table, I've got my little paper bag. I just put the bag down and I'm like, hi guys, my name's Craig, I'm the magician here this evening. I'd like to show you some magic. I can use the bag if I want to, but if I don't want to, I don't have to. Sometimes people say to me, what's in the bag? And I go, well, you know, I'll come back later on and I'll show you. Or if I've got time, I'll come back later on and I'll show you. A lot of the time people don't mention it at all, but it gives me the flexibility to go into cube magic if I want to. But if I don't want to, I don't have to. And I just literally pop it down on the table and it doesn't affect anything. It doesn't take up any pocket space or anything because everything's self-contained inside this paper bag. Um, and yeah, that's that's how I do it, I do things. So when I'm doing table magic, I have my little bag. When I'm doing walk around, I have just a regular cube, Venom cube uh, and stuff like that. I tend to keep for uh, stage or parlor performances. If I am gonna use a gimmick, it's gonna be a mini cube shell from Rubik's Dream because that's gonna take up no pocket space. Okay, so the next question is from Zach Foster, and Zach says, always look forward to these Q&As. Here's a question I think every once in a while, I think of every once in a while, uh, and I'd like a personal opinion on. Do you ever perform tricks that have great audience feedback, but you don't enjoy performing? For example, I know some magicians don't like sponge balls, but audience feedback always seems great, so some magicians will always perform with sponge balls anyway. I ask because I've experienced this. There is always a trick I'm not sold on from a performer's perspective, but the audience seems to enjoy it more than I expected. So do you keep any tricks in your repertoire that you feel indifferent about or you just don't like because the audience seems to enjoy them? Thanks. Um, not really. <coughs> not really. I'm trying to think if there's anything. Uh, if I don't like a trick, it doesn't really make it into my repertoire, to be perfectly honest. And if I start to perform the trick and I start to fall out of love with it, I take it out of my repertoire. And the reason is... I think if you're going to give a convincing performance, if you're going to get people to buy into it, then you've got to love the trick yourself. I think that your enthusiasm will sell that trick to the audience that you're performing for. If I'm doing a trick and it's it's kind of like dull, if, I, if I'm not 100% bought into the trick or, or I don't particularly like it that much, then that ambivalence is going to come across to my audience and they probably won't like it either. So, uh, you know, it's kind of like, um, you know, it's, it's that old business adjective, isn't it? Which is, you know, you've got to believe in yourself and you've got to believe in your product. You know, I, my background's in sales and I always used to train, I trained salespeople for years. And one thing I said to them is you've got to believe in the product 100% because if you don't believe in the product, then nobody else will believe in it either. You've got to enthusiasm sells. You know, the most important thing from a sales point of view is, you know, it's that old expression, have sex with every single person that you speak to. And by sex, that's the anachronism, S-E-X, smile, excitement and uh, enthusiasm. Uh, you've got to be enthusiastic. You've got to be excited in order for people to buy the product that you're selling. It's the same as a magician, because when you're going up to people, you're selling yourself. You know, they're making a judgment call on to whether to see you or not to see you. And a lot of the time it's based on how excited and enthusiastic you are. And the tricks that you perform, if you're excited about people seeing them, then they're going to be excited about watching them. If I'm doing a trick and I don't really feel it, I think that would come across to my audience. So, you know, when I, I did sponge balls, I don't do it anymore. Uh, I do sponge, which is a totally different thing, uh, which you can learn from my penguin uh, live. 
uh, which is a transposition between a sponge ball and a coin, but I don't do a sponge ball routine. Um, I, I, that routine I, I don't have a problem with because I want an object that's as polar opposite from a coin as I can get. A coin is hard and metal and round and flat, while a sponge ball is spongy and round and <laughs> red and so on and so forth. But in terms of sponge balls, I did them. And when I stopped, you know, I, I remember going to a gig once, big corporate gig, smashed it, did sponge balls a whole bunch. And then the client came up to me at the end and said, that was amazing. I, I caught the sponge ball trick that you did. Uh, yeah, my, my son just had a magic set from Marvin's Magic and he does that as well. And I'm like, right, well, that's the very last time I'm doing that trick then. And it was, I, I stopped doing it at that point. And um, it, it's got a great place in my kid's show and in my family show, but no, don't do it in, um, don't do it at all. Don't do it at all in, um, in, in close up. Uh, because I think that my lack of enthusiasm would rub off on the audience. So it's a good question. Um, and I think the answer is no. You know, if you're, if you're performing a trick and you don't like it, I think take it out and, and find something that you do like because, you know, ultimately, if you don't do that, people are going to end up, you know, not enjoying your performance. So, yeah, hopefully that uh, that makes sense. So there you go, guys. That's another Q&A in the bag. Thank you once again for watching me right here on Magic TV. I really appreciate it. Do me a favor. If you want to see more videos like this, like the video, subscribe to the channel, leave a comment down below. And if you haven't already done so, please go check out The Net Tricks. You can go check it out right now at www.thenettricks.com. Go check out the trailer. Go check out the sales page. Go check it out. Have a look. Sign up for a month. See what all the fuss is about. We've just had Wayne Goodman on the channel doing a lecture. It was absolutely fantastic. We've got a ton of stuff coming up, uh, coming up on the weeks and months ahead. So, uh, yeah, go check it out. Guys, I will be back again later on today with a whole bunch more videos. And uh, I'll be back next week with another 27 videos. So I'll see you again next week. Thanks very much for watching. My name's Craig from Magic TV. Mm -hmm.